Uh, my name is Kevin Morgan. I'm going to be talking about research that I conducted here in Cardiff with my colleague, uh, Roberta Sonino, who is sitting in the front here, and will be doing the next, the next session. We'll do one session uh, each. Uh, the structure of the talk is very, very simple. We want to try to identify some generic issues around impact, because as you know, impact is looming larger and larger in our research careers. And it's good to know what works where, why, and how. And that's what we, we want to try to uh, address by posing some generic issues, first of all, and then giving some examples of what we try to do in our own work, not suggesting that it's any, any way a template, it's just what we did to try to handle these pressures uh, of impact. And we'll be drawing on our work on the international reform of the school food system. How do you try to design and deliver what we call a sustainable food, school food system? And we did it in Europe, North America, and Africa. So, without further ado, hoping everything works by way of the technology, we've tried to identify four questions around which we'll try to structure the presentation. We need to begin by how we view and value impact, because things are changing radically, and the impact agenda is, has already become an incredibly controversial issue. And one of the reasons why it's controversial, in our view, is because uh, the powers that be in government uh, and in senior university management is in danger of rendering the impact agenda into a very instrumentalist metric as part of an audit system. It's taken, in a sense, some of the lifeblood out of the impact uh, agenda. And no one has done more, it seems to me, to criticize this instrumentalization, sorry about that word, of the impact agenda than Stefan Collini. Many of you will know Collini's book, a marvelous book called What Are Universities For? Uh, I think it's an excellent book, one of the best books I know on the changing uh, structure and meaning of universities in the 21st century. I also think it's wrong in part, but great books don't need to be right, do they? On impact, I think Collini's wrong, in the sense that he takes a very one-sided take on impact. He sees it as a wholly malign agenda, where governments and senior university managers uh, instrumentalize uh, impact, prioritizing, as he says in this quote, a non-intellectual agenda of measuring the, imp the societal impact of our work in terms of social, economic, and wider uh, uh, met, met metrics. So, can I invite you already simply to say, uh, uh, simply to turn to your next door neighbour, and to, it, those of you who've got next door neighbours, uh, I'm sure you, I'm sure you can move up a couple of seats, and you'll, you'll find one. So, those of you who've got next door neighbours, simply to ask, what, given the way you feel about your research, and hopefully it engages your mind and your heart, why should you value? Why should we value uh, impact whatsoever? Let's just devote two minutes and we'll, we'll reconvene right away. So please, invite your neighbor to tell you why, why his or her work is meaningful and has impact, or should have impact. Okay, can we, thank you. Can we, sorry, can we, can we, I'm very conscious I'm inviting you to discuss in an energetic way and then terminate after, after two minutes. So we'll have plenty of time for you to report back on your discussions right at the end when we open it up for general discussion. Okay, I promise you we'll have plenty of time uh, for that. So we've been discussing the impact agenda, why we should value it. And I've introduced the Stefan Collini point that impact is a dangerous agenda and it, uh, it is being instrumentalized, all of which is true. But I want to offer you another dimension so that we appreciate uh, impact in a, more, in, a, in a more balanced and more judicious way. And that is to say that the impact agenda can also be understood as an intrinsically significant agenda. We, some of you will know, be familiar with the work of Amata Sen and Martha Nussbaum, for example, <coughs> on things that are purely instrumentally significant, like money, a means to something else or something that is intrinsically significant, something of great value in and of itself, like health. 
for example, well-being, friendships, so on and so forth. And I, I want to suggest that the impact agenda has a dimension of this. Yes, governments of left and right will try to force us down a narrow set of metrics, but there's another agenda as well. I've never met personally a social scientist which was it, who, who was indifferent to the impact of her or his work. I've never met a social scientist who was totally indifferent. So we all, in various ways, want our work to register in society or in a particular community of practice. In other words, we want our work to register in, in society. And this is becoming more rather than less important. Why? Because social scientists can bring something special to the debate about innovation and social change. Not least because we live in an era of societal challenges. The big societal challenges that we live through today, we know them all well. Let's just remind ourselves. We're talking about things like climate change. We're talking about renewable energy, food security, dignified elder care. These issues resonate all over the world. And Roberta and I found out this, that a, a, a project that I'll talk about in a moment, about school food, which was initially we thought of as a very local concern, we realized 10 years later that this was an issue. School, the quality of food on a child's plate resonated globally, as I hope to, to prove to you uh, in a moment. So social scientists have a big role to play in addressing uh, societal challenges because of the nature of our knowledge process. But also, I think, it's right and proper for governments as representatives, uh, democratic governments, as representatives of the public and taxpayers to know what's being done with, their, with public money. It's right and proper for us to be held accountable. And part of the impact agenda is society holding us as academics accountable for that public money. So I think, uh, you know, I don't feel bad at all about filling in that ESRC form, uh, Pathways to Impact. It's right and proper, both from an intellectual point of view, because it's intrinsically significant, but also from a societal point of view, because it's right and proper. So, those are the general issues. Uh, let, let me now turn quickly to our, our, our research. We both got into this by accident uh, 14, 14 years ago, where we monitored a small project in rural Wales where farmers had hooked up with health professionals to try to get healthy food into schools and hospitals. And they failed at every turn. It was a complete and total failure because almost everything, almost everything they encountered conspired to defeat them. Whether it was the interpretation of European Union public procurement regulations, whether it was catering conventions that preferred to deal with one or two big suppliers rather than lots of many farmers, or whether it was NHS accounting standards which couldn't account for the health gains of nutritious food. And all that enabled low value to masquerade as best value in in health, uh, health catering. So all these factors taken together conspired to keep local food out of local hospitals. And yet, to us as a team, we felt the school food project was a microcosm of some of the most, of some of the most in, in intrinsically important things that any of us could address in the 21st century. Sustainable development, the potential creativity uh, of the public realm, and the biopolitics of health and well-being. These are the biggest issues that concern us. Uh, what greater inequality is there than the inequalities embedded in mortality and morbidity data? Why do some people die earlier than others in some parts of the world? There's not a bigger social science uh, issue, uh, it seems to me. So we started this project as we, what we call uh, as a labor of love. That is to say, completely unfunded something that we wanted to do off our own bat. And we began to learn something very quickly by engaging with these practitioners in the school food system, which I'll share with you uh, in a moment. And these were practitioners who had never been engaged with before because of their, quote, low esteem, like dinner ladies, for example, a point I'll come back to uh, in a moment. <coughs> so it started as a labor of love, a pilot project, because. When you, later in your career, I assume you're all on ESRC uh, uh, fund, funds, 
when you come to, um, to, 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 to apply for your own funding as postdocs, you'll see that funding bodies like to see a track record that you've done some research before you have applied for a grant. So having a little audit trail, sorry to mention that word audit again, but we are held accountable to have done a labour of love, to have engaged with a, a community of practice in your chosen field will score well in your metrics. So it's worth thinking about, and especially if it's meaningful to you. That is to say, if it's an intrinsically significant thing that in, 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 in your minds. So this is how we started, and I'll share more details about this project with you in a moment, and how we actually went engaging with these end users. But let's have another two minutes, just a two minute break, just to share, just to share with your neighbours. Who do you think are the non-academic beneficiaries? The jargon for end users, as the ESSE calls it. Who are the most important end users of your research project? Just two minutes, please, and then we'll reconvene. Okay, thank you. So, shall we move quickly on? Is there somebody urgently who wants to identify a major user of their research before we move on <coughs> from your discussions? A major user? Government. Government. Yeah? Government. We'll come on to these now. Let's move on to these uh, impact uh, metrics uh, in terms of the, the non-academic uh, users of our research. As you know, Stefan Collini sees this <coughs> as a very, very... Uh, uh, a, a, a malign trend where he says uh, uh, it's, uh, it's a government attempt to nudge us, collectively to nudge us into politically approved directions for, 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 the, for their agenda. And I, I, I want you to at least to think critically about that and not to accept it and to challenge it only because I think there are two sides to it. In reality, as we show you, there are f at, least, at least four major communities beneficiaries, or in ESRC terms, end users of our research. There's obviously policy makers running from both local to global. As you'll see in a moment, in our, in our case study, we engaged first locally, then we moved nationally to engage with, with national policy makers, and eventually we ended up engaging uh, globally with global policy makers. Then there's practitioners uh, and professionals in whatever field we're working, unless it's a highly theoretical PhD, those of you who are working in, in applied areas, policy areas, uh, social policy areas, will know that there are defined end user communities for your, for your work. And those communities will have practitioners and professionals there where you need to identify their professional bodies and what are the current debates which resonate in those professional communities. Thirdly then, we have civil society. Civil society organizations were enormously important. I would say, in my own mind, the most important players in some of our own work when we think of the role now, the innovative role that NGOs play in putting new agendas, new ways of framing, new ways of seeing issues. In other words, nudging us again to view and value the world in a different way. NGOs play that role more than governments because they're not constrained in the way that governments are to behave in a risk-averse way. So civil society actors were of enormous significance to us. We learned from them and they had to disseminate uh, our work on our behalf as well. And that's important. In, a, in effect, becoming de facto ambassadors for our research findings, a point I'll come back to in a moment. And then, of course, there's the, there's the private sector, another major player uh, in, 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 in our work. So what did we do? What did we do to engage in all these different ways? Because those of you who have not, not uh, thought much about the school food system uh, before, uh, maybe you've taken it for granted, but it's an incredibly complex system. Nothing might seem more simpler than a school dinner and yet creating or fashioning, designing and supplying a sustainable school meal proved to be enormously com uh, complex because it challenged everyone right along the food chain from farm to fork. It was an enormous challenge. Why? Because of the legacy of the industrial food system, 
which had invited us to believe that low-cost ingredients constituted best value. So we identified from this food chain, we engaged right across, as I say, from farm to fork, but we identified two sets of players, two sets of, of actors who were particularly important, and in our view, were chronically under-researched. And these two groups of actors, school dinner ladies and procu public procurement officers, those men and women in the public sector who procure goods and services on behalf of the public body. What we called, uh, they operated uh, what we called the power of purchase. Government, there's no tool in the government toolbox which has more potential to, ch to affect social and economic change than public procurement. The public procurement budget in the UK today is over 250 billion, billion pounds per annum. No programme comes close to that in terms of thinking about the power of government. And deploying that effectively in a creative and sustainable way was the challenge when we came to thinking about how food was procured for some of the most vulnerable consumers in society, children. So we identified these two groups. Uh, I can't tell you, I can't tell you what a cultural shock it was to school dinner ladies when we first began to interview them. They thought it was a joke, they thought it was a mistake. University researchers had showed up to interview them. Such was their low esteem, they'd never been interviewed before, they'd never met their chief executive, and they'd never met their leader. The, the catering service in local government is the only service which is run and managed by women. And it suffers from institutional sexism. It has an incredibly Cinderella status about it. And here we'd arrived to interview them. Why? Because we valued what they did. We viewed school dinner ladies as health workers in disguise. And when we first put this to them, they thought this was a comical idea. But they soon got to like it because it helped them to review and to revalue and to reimagine their own roles as well. So, school dinner ladies were disempowered, de-skilled, suffering from low self-esteem. The school food, there's something about the, the institution of school food in the UK, not in Italy of course, but in, in the UK, there was something about the school food system, we thought, where it was the butt of cultural stereotyping and satire. You know, something to be endured rather than enjoyed. <coughs> the way school food was portrayed in movies, in literature, for example, it was always a joke that you had to accustom yourself to bad food. So, the butt of jokes, and then facing lots of ethical dilemmas. Some of the biggest research dilemmas <coughs> I've ever had in my career were all to do with this project. I haven't got time to go into them now, but they were the most challenging issues we ever, I personally ever faced in my research career. So uh, it's a, it meant a big deal to me, this project. So Dinner Ladies were one uh, coalition. The other coalition, uh, professional coalition, were procurement officers. There was something in common with school dinner ladies about these men and women. Why? Because they too suffered from a Cinderella status. These were the backroom boffins who organizations took for granted. They just bought goods and services, and they were given a low price mandate. Here's, here, here's your catering criteria, low cost, go, go do. It was simply as simple as that. So these were trapped in a low cost catering culture and they had a fear of European Union regulations. And yet, showing the value of comparative research, looking at the same institution in different cultural contexts, proved incredibly rewarding. We did a lot of interviews uh, in, in, in Italy, in Rome, where Roberta is from, and we discovered that the Roman system was delivering some of the finest school food we'd seen anywhere in Europe. In the end, the mayor of Rome invited us to Rome to eat a school dinner with him. Mm -hmm. And by the way, uh, I, as, as I seem to remember, Rob, it was Welsh lamb on the agenda, and he said it was pure coincidence. But it was a, and, and by the way, because I haven't got time to go into this, it was a marvellous institution. It was a cultural institution because food was valued. The children ate off china plates. 
with real knives and forks. A teacher sat at every table because, as she said, this is a pedagogic process. They eat what I eat. And above all, what, re what was remarkable to us all was the lack of choice. There was no, in the best system we encountered, there was no choice. That is to say, it was a three course meal, but no choice. Salad, meat and uh, veg, fruit, end of story. When at the time, choice was being lionized and fetishized in the UK. And when we once paid a school dinner lady from Wales to go to Tuscany as part of a fact-finding uh, 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 trip, and we said, here's the deal, we pay for you to go, but you come back and you tell us what you found. She went, she came back, we asked her what, 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 what was the most significant thing you saw, and she said, the lack of choice. We have to provide lots of poor quality food, chips, pizza, every day, lots of waste. Choice equals waste and poor food. This is one of the findings we found. So it was an enormously educational experience for us to engage with school dinner ladies, first of all. And remember, this was three years before the <coughs> Jamie Oliver TV programs. Very important because, because school food wasn't on the agenda uh, and wasn't in the minds of politicians. Jamie Oliver helped us a lot because he put it on the radar and his producer bought some of our working papers. So he made a big difference. But what he didn't, doesn't tell you, he learned more from the dinner ladies in Greenwich than they learned from him. But that's another story. That's a fact that spoils a good story. So these are the two big communities that we dealt with and we learned what, what mattered to them. That was very, very important. Spent a lot of time with these two communities. Short break, while we discuss what kind of impacts could your work uh, achieve. Just two minutes, and then we'll go to our final session, and then we'll wind up with a general discussion of some of these issues. So please, confer among yourselves for two minutes, and we'll move on. <laughs> Okay, everyone, thank you. Come on, let's, let's move on to our final session then. So this is the final set, set, set of issues that I want to share with you. It's about what kind of impact can we achieve. Helping stakeholders to make informed choices was one of the ones that we set a high premium on. That is to say, helping the people that we're engaging with, whether they're policy makers, practitioners, civil society agents, whatever, helping them to reimagine another world, another way of doing something, another way of viewing and valuing the activity, whatever you're engaged in. Comparative research, by the way, is one of the ways, as you know, uh, in our own work that we drew on when we drew on the good practice uh, from Italy. Secondly, it helps our end users, as they're called, to, uh, to deal with things like fear uh, and uncertainty. And it avoids the, the, the isolation of being an innovator. If we're trying to encourage people in our, in our engagement, trying to help them to do something new, uh, the fear of innovating in a world of uncertainty is very great and it becomes a barrier. In later work that, that, that we've done following our school food work, we've done a lot of work uh, uh, with the city of Bristol, which as you know, this year is European green capital. And in Bristol, we brought, we brought over the dinner lady team as they call it, from the city of Malmö. Malmö in Sweden has an enormous track record in terms of the school food system. Uh, not least because it has one of the most ambitious agendas we've ever encountered anywhere in Europe. They plan to go fully organic in all their public canteens by 2020 in a cost-neutral way. In a cost-neutral way, which I'd never ever heard of before. And we can go into the details later, but the I thought that was a mission impossible. But they had two, two key areas of reform to help them to do that. Number one, radical menu redesign. Redesigning the menu to take some meat out of the diet. Not entirely, but to reduce meat. Less meat, but better meat. And suddenly their carbon footprint uh, is radically reduced, as some of you will know. And then the second one is radically reducing the cost of waste. So with very, very zero waste, you factor those economies back into the front end to allow you to buy better ingredients. 
these are the these are the lessons that they brought to Bristol to share between different catering teams, for example. So it helped the Bristol people to avoid, as I say, the fear of isolate, uh, isolation when they're trying to procure goods and services in a new way. Because in the UK, as Roberta and my work showed very clearly, procurement officials hid behind EU regulations. They said, well, e European Union regulations forbid us to do these things, when of course they don't. European Union regulations apply to Italy as much as they do to the UK. In Italy, they were used to foster innovation. In the UK, they were used as an excuse to frustrate it. So again, comparative research helped to unlock different ways of doing something, and we were, we, we were enabled to, in a sense, to import these insights, this experience, back into, <coughs> into the United Kingdom and share them with, dinner, with food, school food teams uh, in the United Kingdom. And this is what we try to do. We help our stakeholders, as we call them, school food teams, we help them to reimagine a different kind of school food system. How do you value food? How do you procure it? How do you design tenders where you weight non-price factors overall, quality factors, as much as price? How do you do these things and still remain compliant with European Union regulations? This is, this is you know, important knowledge uh, that hadn't been won properly, hadn't been secured, this knowledge, hadn't been earthed in the UK, and it, we, it, it had to import it from Italy. We identified dissemination, good practices, and good practice, by the way, as we often said in our work, in our work we found that good practice was often a bad traveler. That is to say, good practice would be identified in one municipality, but it hadn't traveled next door. Why? Because innovation is about people. And when we found, as I say, in the case of Rome, where we found the best school food system in Europe, as I keep saying, uh, it's not no longer the best, by the way, because they've had a new mayor, and he's un he unraveled the school food system. But when it was the best, we asked the head of school food, uh, what are the secrets of success, of your success? And she said two things. She said, number one, political will. The mayor of Rome is totally committed to a good school food system. So uh, me and my team never have to look over our shoulders at our political masters. I have the confidence of my political masters. Number one, political will. And the second was professional competence. She and her team were professionally proficient at designing and delivering, and monitoring, by the way, and policing a sustainable school food, school food system. All these things hung together. And those are the two secret ingredients. And we worked with the media a lot. We are journalists men and women in the media who we knew cared about this issue. There's no point sending your results off to Dear Financial Times, or Dear Sun, or Dear Daily Mirror, or whoever you deal with. <coughs> you have to identify key journalists, men and women in those media outlets who care about this issue. And then they'll get back to you. And you can build up a relationship. So that relationship with the media is a process and not an event. It's an ongoing thing, that engagement, because good engagement, as we'll show in a moment, is one of the secret ingredients of good impact. So, let me ditch this last question and we'll, we'll merge it into, into the general discussion. So the, one of the key things that we try to do, because time is moving on, one of the key things we try to do overall in this work was to help the school food teams to revisualize, to reimagine a school food system, to identify good practice, and above all, to try to persuade them that far from being a pure, narrow commercial service which had to earn a profit or a loss every year, they were dealing with a health and well being service. And when you think of the enormous human and ecological costs that we've externalized, by cheapening our food, what you might call the high price of low cost. When we think of those, the public health costs, the ecological costs of industrial food system, those costs have been externalized. They're not contained, are they, in the price of cheap food. We try to internalize these costs. And we help to persuade the powers that be, 
policymakers as well as caterers that the school food system was a health and well-being service and had to be viewed and valued in those terms and not in terms of a narrow cost accounting framework which you would judge, the, uh, judge a, a widget factory, for example. You are serving ch food to children. Of course, in Scandinavia, this is not an issue. In Sweden, in Finland, for example, all children get free food. School food is free at a point of consumption, paid for out of general taxation. Why? Because the Swedes believe that children eating good food is an investment, a long-term investment, not just in terms of citizenship and social justice, but in terms of public health. A few more pennies today save a lot more pounds tomorrow. I know it's simple, but it's meaningful and it's important. So this is what I think was one of the most important sides of, of our work, was doing that kind of stuff. And because I'm needing to rush on, I'm getting signals that I'm being too verbose, I just wanted to end by saying this. When we, when we started our work, some of our colleagues thought this was a rather comical topic. You can't be serious that you're going to study school dinners. Some of it was beneath the dignity of the academy. But because we framed it in a way that the school dinner was a microcosm of these larger things that we talked about, sustainable development, creative public spheres, uh, biopolitics of, 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 of health and well-being, we saw the school dinner as an embodiment of these larger things. And therefore, it needed to be viewed and validated in, the, in a more serious way which Jamie Oliver helped us to do, of course, later on. But this, as I say, this was three years ahead of it. Years later, of course, these colleagues extol this project. Colleagues who found it comical at the start now extol it. Why? Because it was validated by ESRC money. On the one hand, research money, the only metric that counts in an instrumentalist set of metrics, which only value things instrumentally. But the high point, I think I'm speaking for Roberta as well, uh, but certainly uh, uh, for me as well, the high point of this school food research was being invited to the United Nations in New York to present the findings of our book. The, 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 the book is called The School Food Revolution. And when we presented it in New York, we suddenly realized that what we'd always thought of as an issue of local resonance was something that had enormous global resonance. Because people from all over the world were concerned, were agitated, aspired to provide good food on a child's plate. And it was a, it's a wonderful honor and a privilege to be engaged in trying to view and value those things uh, in, a, in a setting like the United Nations. And here in the UK, NGOs helped us to do that. The Soil Association, the local caterers association. So I implore you to engage with these bodies because they can become your de facto uh, ambassadors.